Well, hello everybody. For the final time, you will be glad to get rid of my face off your screen. I know uh, somebody once said I had the perfect face for radio, uh, but there we are. Uh, bless you for enduring to the end. If you did my previous uh, Bible studies as well, it's been like 10 times you've had to look at my face uh, over the last few months. But bless you. Thank you for enduring on to uh, the end. Well, we're on week five of our Dig Into Jonah the God who changed his mind. And we've looked at big picture thinking around that, how context is important and we what we learn about Jonah. We then dug into Jonah's attitude a little bit. We looked at God's, uh, if you like, attitude towards the Gentiles and how they responded to that, how that was a surprise to Jonah and maybe a surprise to his listeners. And then we saw last time we were together uh, something of God himself, that he is the God who will relent if we'll repent uh, that he's compassionate and that most of all the story of Jonah is about God chastening the prophet, uh, literally hunting the prophet down in the form of this great fish um, and I hope you've had great reflections on that. It's an amazing book and we're drawing this now to a conclusion by thinking about the question that must be answered and uh, this uh, brings us to this incredible conclusion in the book. So um, we're going to do one more reading together. Jonah chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. Why don't you pause the recording, do the reading together, and then I will see you in a minute. Bye-bye. Okay, wonderful. So hopefully you've read that together. Now, if, if you take the time to read the book of Jonah in one reading, which is the way it's sort of supposed to be read, really, uh, what you discover is a, an absolutely dramatic opening scene uh, mirrored by an incredibly dramatic closing scene. So the book opens with, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, go to Nineveh. And then it says, and Jonah arose and ran from the presence of the Lord. I mean, you can't get much more dramatic in that than this prophetic book. And one of the things that sets the book of Jonah apart from the other prophets, which is really interesting, and that dramatic opening sort of illustrates it, is that the book of Jonah is really a book about Jonah, whereas all the other prophets is really more about what the prophets say. So you get a little bit of insight into each prophet and get a bit of background or an insight into Jeremiah or Hosea, but their books aren't really about them. Their books are about what they say. The book of Jonah uh, that sits uh, as book number five in the 12 of the prophets, what we would call the minor prophets as Christians in the Tanakh is just called the prophets. That actually uh, this, this book number five that sits within that uh, of the section of the 12 is more about Jonah than it is about anything he says. In fact, we're, he doesn't really say a lot in the context of this book. Um, and certainly everything that he is saying is really very uh, much about himself apart from the sermon that he gives to Nineveh. So the opening session, the opening few sentences are dramatic because actually we're introduced immediately that this is not so much about what the prophet will say. It's really about the prophet. So this dramatic conclusion and the book finishes in, in an equally dramatic way where you have a face-off between the prophet and the Lord. So uh, the book opens with, with God seeking the prophet and he runs away from the face of God. Now the two of them are face to face at the end of the book. And it's almost like, now forgive me for this, this is my imagination. It's almost like they're standing uh, outside the city in a court of law uh, and they're like assessing what is going on here and what has just happened. And in chapter four, you may have noticed of the book of Jonah, you've essentially got Jonah's prayer I prefer to call it a sermon or a rant uh, he's having a right old good go at God and then you have the Lord's response uh, to that now what's really interesting I don't know if you remember a million years ago back in our second session together we talked about the symmetry of the book the symmetry of chapters one and three the symmetry is chapters uh, two and four and then I said there was a symmetry even within chapter four so let me come back to that and reintroduce that to you. Jonah's, well, we'll call it a prayer. Jonah's prayer captured in verses two and three um, is exactly 39 words 
in the Hebrew text. Now you're just going to have to trust me on this. I've literally read that and counted the words. So uh, 39 words in the Hebrew text. The response of the Lord in verses 10 to 11 is exactly 39 words. So this is an amazing moment. Now this doesn't work in English but it does work in the language of the prophet uh, Jonah. So it's almost as if Jonah makes his final plea and then God, the creator of the universe, who could have just swatted Jonah to the side, who could have squashed him, forgive me, like a bug. I mean, Jonah's audacity is, is borderline blasphemous. And God, instead of like, lecturing the prophet or, or you know, getting in his face and winning the argument hands down, responds to the prophet's complaint with exactly the same amount of words. That's what, that's what makes me think of it being a courtroom. It's almost like one argument is presented and then another argument is presented and we're sort of being asked to decide whose argument do you want to accept. It's a beautiful, magnificent, poetic, prophetic way to finish the book. In fact, when you look at verse 11 of chapter 4 of Jonah, uh, we are struck with an amazing thought. Let me just read it to you. This is God speaking to Jonah. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Now, you can check this out, but this is the only book in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, that finishes with a question from God. Okay, check it out. Now, the prophet Nahum finishes with a question, but it's not from the Lord directly. Uh, this is the only one from the Lord. And so we are left with this cliffhanger conclusion. Um, God asked this question and there's no answer. Jonah doesn't answer. The Lord doesn't answer. The Ninevites don't answer. Nobody's speaking. The, the, the book finishes on this cliff hanger question should I not have concern okay and in this question it brings the book to this dramatic conclusion because it was because of that concern that the book started in the first place it was out of concern that God called Jonah it was out of concern that he wanted Jonah to go now we're back to the concern that started the book and you've got God at the end of the book now saying do I not have a right to be concerned. You've been upset, Jonah, over the plant. You've been upset over the worm. In fact, Jonah, you're upset over most things, but you've been more upset over the plant than you are over the people. Have I not got a right, Jonah, to be upset? Have I not got a right to be concerned? And so this dramatic book comes to a dramatic conclusion uh, in this way. In that we are asked to listen to the argument of Jonah and then we are asked to listen to the argument of God and we are then asked to decide which one do we accept? Which one do we believe? And so I want to leave you with this thought and you can reflect on it tonight. This question was not only for Jonah's ears but this question was for the ears of his people, Israel, but I also believe that this question is not just for them, Israel. This question is for us. Should I not have concern for this great city? And the Lord would make that appeal today to his church. Church that is often concerned about many things but the great cities of the world. A church that is sometimes consumed in its own self-importance. A church that sometimes gets consumed more in its own blessing and prosperity than it does in the lostness of the world in which it is placed and the peoples of the world to which it has been sent. And the Lord would appeal to me and you and the Lord would say, should I not have concern? And if I should have concern, should you not have concern? Should you not be concerned? for the nations of the world? Should you not reach out beyond your prejudice and your reluctance, can I say carefully, your evil, in order to do the will of the Lord? And actually, we get this incredible conclusion. And here's the conclusion. God is saying to Jonah, I changed my mind. Why can't you change yours? 
If I relented, if I pulled back from destroying these people, why can't you change your mind? Why can't you change your view about them? Why can't you change your prejudice? Why can't you change your reluctance? Why can't you move from having evil intent in your heart for these Gentiles and actually have a heart of love and grace and compassion as I have? He's saying to Jonah right at the end, if I can change, you can change. If I can change my mind, you can change yours. And that's one of the great ongoing challenges of every follower of Jesus. Is not allowing our prejudice, not allowing our reluctance, not allowing our culture, not allowing our personality, not allowing our own personal worldview to get in the way of the purpose of God for our lives. That you and I have to be prepared to change. If that change is demanded of the Lord, if that change means aligning ourselves with him rather than aligning ourselves with our own ideas and our own conclusions. Jonah, did he change? I don't know. The text remains silent. We have nothing. There's no lovely little appendage that, oh, by the way, Jonah got his act together and he became a great prophet. We have nothing else said about Jonah in the biblical text. We're left on this cliffhanger because Jonah is being confronted with the question, if I can change, why can't you? If I can be concerned for the Gentiles, why can't you be? So in your reflections tonight, your final reflections together, I pray that the book of Jonah has been both enlightening and challenging. I pray that it has both been informative, but shocking and disturbing. If you can read the book of Jonah and not be disturbed, then I'm not sure we're reading it right. I read the book of Jonah and every time I'm looking into my own soul asking, is there reluctance within me? Is there prejudice within me? Is there an unwillingness to change within me? Is there, can I say it, evil within me? Not in the moral sense, but in the refusal to accept God's way. Is that within me? Is it possible that I'm a good person on one area of my life and yet reluctant on another? And I never want to be like that. I don't I don't personally ever want to run away from the purpose of God. I don't want to run away from the heart of God. And I don't want to try and fit God into my worldview. I want to conform my life to his worldview. And so as dramatically as the book begins, it finishes. It finishes with a question, a question that you must answer and I must answer. And the question is this, if God can change, then why can't you? If God can show compassion and grace to the great city of Nineveh, then why can't me and you to the great cities of the world? May God bless you. May he guide you. May he help you. And may you always be soft, sensitive and obedient to his voice and to his word. In Jesus' name, amen.